Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for an important conversation that is needed. My name is Kasama Starr, and I'm a 2L at Pace Law. I thank um, my Dean Anderson and my, the fellow eBoard members of our student clubs, and two of them are here today to help things go smoothly, Vivian Lee and Kayla Conti. APALSA, the Asian Pacific Law Students Association, PILS, Pace Immigration Law Society, and PILSO, Public Interest Law Student Organizations, are proud for making this event possible, as well as our other sponsors the Westchester Women's Bar, Mayor Brown, Fenwick, Critical Legal Collective, Asian American Legal Defense Education Fund, and of course, Albany, the Asian American Bar Association of New York and Pace Law. For those of you who are attending for CLE, two codes will be announced during the program. Please check the chat for additional information, but I will also read Albany's accreditation notice right now. The Asian American Bar Association of New York is certified by the New York State Continuing Legal Education Board as an accredited provider. The program has been approved in accordance with the requirements of the CLE board for a maximum of one and a half credits in which half a credit will be applied to the diversity and inclusion requirement and one credit will be applied to the areas of professional practice requirement. This program is suitable for both transitional and non-transitional New York attorneys. You must have pre-registered and confirmed for this to receive CLE credit. The first page of the written materials that were emailed to you is an attorney affirmation, which you must complete and return to CLE at albany.org. Two codes will be announced during this program. Please record the code on the attorney affirmation. Please return your affirmation as soon as possible within one week so that we can send you your certificate. You also received a link for an online evaluation for this session with the written materials. Please kindly complete the evaluation so that we can improve our programs. This program is being recorded for archival purposes. Your continued attendance in this program constitutes your consent to transmit, record, and use your voice and image for this purpose. This program is suitable for both transitional and non-transitional New York attorneys. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. My introductions will be brief, but you can access their full bio in the supporting materials. Neil Kotanda is a professor emeritus at Western College of Law in Irvine, California since 2018. He has written extensively on racial theory, critical race theory, and Asian American jurisprudence. He is a co-author of the Conference on Critical Race Theory and developed the earliest courses on Asian American jurisprudence. In 2008, he delivered the inaugural Neil Gotanda Lecture in Asian American Jurisprudence of the Asian American Law Journal at Berkeley, California. In fall 2009, he was Fulbright Scholar at Wuhan University School of Law in Wuhan, China. He is co-editor with Kimberly Crenshaw, Gary Peller, and Kendall Thomas of the foundational text, Critical Race Theory, the key writings that form the movement. He is a graduate of Stanford University, UC Berkeley School of Law, and Harvard Law School. Vinay Harpalani is the Henry Way Hoffman Professor and Associate Professor of Law at the University of New Mexico School of Law where he teaches courses in constitutional law, civil procedure, employment discrimination, and race and law. Professor Harpalani is recognized as a national expert on affirmative action in university admissions. He has been quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine, among other media outlets. He has written about skin color discrimination, racial identity among black children, and Asian Americans position in the US racial landscape. Professor Harpalani earned his JD from New York University School of Law, his PhD and master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and his bachelor's degrees from the University of Delaware. Professor Lin's scholarship focuses on the constructions of race, disability, and gender, and their legal regulation within the political economy. From 2013 to 2018, Professor Lin was a senior associate at Outen and Golden, LLP, a national labor and employment law firm where she advised and litigated on behalf of plaintiffs on civil rights and commercial matters. Upon graduating from the City University New York School of Law, she clerked for the Honorable Denny Chin of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And she completed a Skadden Fellowship with the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Professor Lin has also served as the Director of Community Organizing for New Immigrant Community Empowerment, advocating for the rights of immigrants post 9-11, and as a member board of the directors of ADUCAR, a women-led immigration worker center, both in Queens, New York. I would also, oh, I'm sorry, that's it. And without further ado, I would um, like Neil Gotanda to please start the program. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? My I, am I unmuted and uh, on screen? Okay, 
Well, um, special thanks to everyone um, who has helped organize this. Um, uh, uh, my co-panelists, the sponsoring organizations, uh, and especially to Kasama Starr for her extraordinary work in all of the detail organizing. So I'm going to present um, a short essay in three parts. Uh, first, some notes on critical race theory. Second, uh, uh, comments and thoughts on racial formation uh, of the Asian American um, category. And third, uh, American Wars, China, and the New Cold War. So um, uh, in terms of critical race theory, uh, um, I would suggest that one of the ways to approach uh, what's been the, the continuing uh, discussions and use of the term critical race theory uh, is that there, there are uh, at least, but uh, and principally three flavors of critical race theory. Uh, first is the older academic tradition begun in legal studies with Derek Bell and critical legal and critical legal studies, uh, taking the form of the workshop on critical race theory. Um, traditional CRT remains largely academic, uh, and only in recent years has become uh, more political, uh, as in a responsive mode. So, um, for this essay, um, rather than trying to define what critical race theory is, uh, traditional academic critical race theory. Uh, I'm going to use uh, our old methodology, our traditional methodology, uh, the CRT approach, which is to say a critical examination and critique of existing uh, doctrines and usages. So second flavor um, is the use of CRT as a general reference uh, to black consciousness. So, um, I, you see this on uh, the news, um, news services. If you Google critical race theory, you'll see a series of efforts to define um, uh, what critical race theory is or may not be. Uh, the ones that are uh, less hostile uh, are generally references to black consciousness in various forms, especially in education. Um, and so uh, CRT has become kind of a generic uh, a, a category for all forms of black consciousness. Now, I'm not gonna discuss that particular flavor any, uh, at this time. The third and most important flavor uh, of critical race theory uh, is what I would describe as um, Fox News, Republican Party, uh, anti-blackness dog whistle CRT. All right, so that's a mouthful. So, uh, and the main, uh, it, since I see the main ideological theme of this labor uh, as aimed at black consciousness, uh, I'm going to shorthand this to dog whistle CRT. And so that's the term I'm going to be using for uh, what's going on uh, to, uh, in terms of my conversations and my comments on critical race theory. Uh, and what's important to understand is that this strand, dog whistle CRT, shares the name critical race theory, but little else with the other forms of critical race theory, traditional and generic black consciousness. So um, uh, under various forms, dog whistle CRT has been the vehicle for the extraordinary continued attacks uh, on the content of our educational system. Uh, uh, it's, it's also important not to be distracted by the su supposed content uh, of dog whistle CRT. This is not a collection of real ideas, but instead is an ideological assault on black consciousness. Um, it is not a serious critique or even criticism. Uh, dog whistle CRT is political theater uh, and dishonest claims, straight up dishonest, uh, dressed up as uh, pseudo intellectualism. So within that, um, I would suggest that uh, there are at least three dimensions. So, uh, I, I notice, or I can discern three dimensions uh, to dog whistle CRT. First, its function. And here I, uh, I, um, and I'm going to mention uh, Bob Chang's work. Uh, um, I draw upon Bob Chang's work in his um, uh, Derek Bell lecture at NYU. Um, uh, one, it, the function of dog whistle CRT is to renew whiteness. And of course, because it uses the dog whistle format, and I'm borrowing, of course, from Ian Haney Lopez's work, um, uh, um, to renew whiteness, but it does it without mentioning white or race. 
second dimension of dog whistle CRT is that the means chosen is to suppress black consciousness in any and for um, uh, multiple formats. Uh, and by suppressing black consciousness, I mean both uh, of, um, of uh, uh, about black uh, uh, awareness and also by African-Americans and blacks themselves. So it's both uh, suppression in both formats. And third, the terrain on which this uh, dog whistle CRT operates is the black white paradigm. That is to say, it operates within the American formulation of race, uh, which in its um, principle and uh, um, uh, principle boundaries encompasses only black and white. So um, what do I mean by this uh, kind of focus? The key political focus of dog whistle CRT uh, are primarily in education, have the effect of suppressing black consciousness, but notice what is omitted. These attacks take place within the black white paradigm and make no mention of other non-whites or other racial groups or categories. So there is no room for add-on races or add-on educational materials within the attacks uh, 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 of dog whistle CRT. The use of the black-white binary as the totality of the racial terrain means that if you do not identify as black or white, then you must choose between black and white, explicitly or implicitly, in the positions and uh, actions that you take. In other words, there are, there are no Asian Americans or Latinx or indigenous peoples in dog whistle CRT. But then how were we supposed to try and navigate the American racial terrain to avoid the binary trap of uh, dog whistle CRT? My suggestion, and this is only one of many possible entry points, is, is to examine the Asian American category using racial formation theory. Um, and here uh, I would say it, the uh, current um, outstanding presentation and formulation about the idea, uh, the notion of racial formation of Asian Americans is um, Robert Chang's uh, Derek Bell lecture, uh, uh, NYU uh, uh, lecture, which is available online um, and uh, encompasses many of the comments that I'm about to make. So uh, my goal is this, in, in terms of uh, describing the Asian American category, the interrogation of Asian American, is to first of all note that the category is not fixed or subject to definition, uh, but rather it's a question of social formation or work in progress. And for analysis from law, uh, I use the racial category, it is a legally cognizable category, uh, as a moment of a point of investigation. So laws affecting groups or, and identities usually define or name the group involved. And so this makes possible examination of statutes, cases, and legal practices to see how the categories have, have evolved. Um, there are several important treatments of the Black and Negro category, a vast, a vast literature. For Asians, uh, Ian Haney Lopez's book, White by Law, examines how various Asian uh, or Asiatic categories evolved in immigration and citizen law. And, and then, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, Bob Chang's NYU Derek Bell lecture, uh, Racial Realism Today. Uh, is an important, is uh, the, the best summary uh, to, to date uh, of this process. So what do we, what notes do we take about this formation of the Asian American category? I point to the fact, to the, to the observation that the Asian American, as we understand it, doesn't exist before 1965. So the 50th anniversary of the San Francisco State UC Berkeley ethnic studies strikes uh, Yuji Ichioka's invention uh, of the political terminology Asian American uh, through the Asian American Political uh, Alliance, through APA. Um, uh, it marks the beginning of the political notion uh, of the term Asian American. So, well, then how does this race, how does racial formation in the broader social sense take place? Uh, it's a complex question. And so I choose as one strand in terms of the formation of the Asian American um, to look at the various forms of subordination uh, that take place. In other words, what are the various ways in which people who are either ascribed uh, an identity as Asian of some form or self-identify in some form within one of the, the uh, complex 
uh, Pan-Asian array of possibilities. So various subordinations include personal violence, group violence, segregation, employment discrimination, sexualized violence, uh, ascribed foreignness, uh, and others. So analytically, the process of racial formation includes the perpetrator, the victim, and the social response. So uh, in terms of uh, theor uh, social theory, the Asian American category is then the social reification of these processes into the Asian American category. Um, it, it's, it's social theory. So if it's sort of like uh, reification and it, your eyes, if your eyes gloss over it, don't worry. Um, but consider the case of Vincent Chin, which involved the most important mode of subordination, personal violence. Vincent Chin's attackers believed he was Japanese based upon a body type. So the attacker's motivation encompassed a racialized body. Chin's self-identification as Chinese was suppressed in the violent attacks. And most important for racial category formation were the community responses, especially the organizing around uh, as a response around an Asian American identity. And this focus upon Asian American collective identification occurred at a time, at both at the time of the mobilizations and also in subsequent reinterpretation of the events. Today, uh, we can see Asian American interpretations that link together disparate events and groups, the Sikh Temple Massacre, the Atlanta spa shootings, attacks against elderly Asians in New York, San Francisco, Chicago, the collective response to link these various wide, these widely varied events through the commonality of violent subordination is a key part of the formation of the Asian American racial category. In other words, the response itself as an Asian American response helps to formulate, reinforce, and build the Asian American category. So the last two decades of violence against particular Asiatic, Asiatic body types have generated increased collective group identification as Asian American. Now, less discussed is that the central model for violence against racialized bodies is violence against black bodies. That is violence against black bodies has been normalized and seen as acceptable. In the black white paradigmatic worldview, such violence against uh, racialized bodies is, the, is then permissible and then is permissible by extension against other body types, especially those not identified as white. So this is an interpretation at a very abstract level that tries to, that links together the violence against black bodies and the violence against Asiatic bodies as part of the overall fabric of racial formation. American social violence in the uh, framework of racial formation provides the broad social matrix in which this takes place. The discursive social media uh, is then the context uh, uh, for this kind of dog whistle critical race theory. So um, this is an, a, a, the beginnings of an effort to uh, develop a dog whistle CRT uh, for Asian Americans. Now, my final section addresses some future speculation. The, the other sources of, uh, sources of normalization of violence against Asiatic bodies have been multiple Asian wars in uh, American wars in Asia. The primary model, um, the primary model uh, for uh, individual and group violence against Asiatic bodies uh, is the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans in concentration camps. Uh, this particular form of group violence had clear poles, political and cultural ancestry in American Indian reservations. So this come this final set of comments is the speculation on how the next round of violent, of American violence in Asia will play out. Uh, my crystal ball, and it's one shared by many others, uh, predicts that we will continue to see increasing actions taken against China and Chinese as the geopolitical impulses press forward with the pivot to Asia. As a preview of what may be uh, coming, notice that the military and diplomatic actions against Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan with the grounds for financial, social, and immigration sanctions uh, against individuals in these countries. Similar sanctions against the vast array of social, political, and financial connections uh, to China might be taken in the near future. 
these sanctions will apply against Chinese uh, in a racialized context. So as a counterexample, there is a foreign campaign that does not appear to have a significant racialized component. Consider our campaign against Russia. Today, as sanctions and military actions continue, the formulation of Russians as a racialized minority has not taken place in government, media, or popular responses. Well, a simplistic color race scheme could simply say Russians are white, so there's no racial campaign. Um, in our racial formation model, we take note of the absence of a Russian body type uh, uh, in domestic actions against Russians uh, that would complement our foreign campaign. There is no looks like a Russian image generated as an aspect of these campaigns. The contrast, of course, is seen in the comparison of our actions around China. Uh, just as 9-11 gave rise to widespread personal violence who someone who looked like an Arab, uh, so too personal get violence against someone who looks Chinese, it continued to worsen. We have seen how the supposed link of COVID to the Chinese government has provided encouragements for such personal violence against Asiatic body types and not limited to Chinese. So uh, uh, I suggest there, a, a racialization framework. We need to self-reflect on the process of racial formation. How do we become Asian American and, uh, or not uh, as the, as the uh, uh, political um, uh, notion of racial formation takes place? Um, and we need to focus upon a primary mode of subordination, violence as systemic and embedded within the fabric of American racial society. We must never forget that the essential nature of this violent racial fabric has been black subordination. So uh, I do not have a suggestion about how this should affect our actual racial politics, speculations, but no uh, um, um, concrete political organizing um, uh, is something I've never been uh, uh, especially adept at. Uh, I think that simple calls for solidarity uh, are inadequate given the very different processes of racial formation uh, among uh, on the American racial land, uh, terrain. But in our in, in intellectual investigations involving an Asian American or a Chinese or Japanese or Indian category, I believe we must encompass at least implicitly uh, violence, the violence aimed at black bodies. We need to discuss explicitly the forms of dog whistle Asian American representation. So um, as a concluding comment, um, I'll cite to Bob Chang again from his racial realism lecture. He suggests we, you need to learn your history first. Second, learn the history of those who are not you. And then it's upon us to take appropriate action. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gotanda. Um, for those of you attending for um, CLE, Professor Harpalani, you are the next speaker. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Right. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Bonnie uh, for inviting me to take part uh, in this, you know, uh, great event. I thank uh, Pace Law School and Kasama, especially for. Uh, doing such a thorough job in, in organizing this. Um, it's wonderful to work with her. Uh, I'm going to uh, build on the excellent points that Neil just made. I think, you know, he gave a nice breakdown of critical race theory, you know, the different strands, how the term is used. And I'll focus on uh, racial triangulation, the idea of racial triangulation, and kind of related to uh, different controversies, debates that have involved Asian Americans in the realm of education, particularly uh, affirmative action, uh, case going before the US Supreme Court next term against Harvard, which involves Asian American uh, plaintiffs. Uh, so racial triangulation, uh, 
theory uh, by Professor Claire Jean Kim at UC Irvine. Uh, she basically talks about how Asian Americans are positioned in uh, US racial dynamics. And she says, you know, look at Asian Americans and with respect to white Americans and black Americans, you see Asian Americans being valorized, uh, you know, praised in particular ways, uh, elevated. The quote unquote model minority uh, stereotype is an exemplar uh, of that. Uh, but you also see Asian Americans uh, face this kind of what she calls civic ostracism. That they're not really viewed as American. They're uh, associated with foreign countries. Uh, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, we saw Donald Trump using terms like China virus. So Asian Americans are also ostracized, uh, simultaneously uh, valorized and ostracized uh, within uh, American racial dynamics. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of historical background here. Uh, go back to the early 20th, late 19th, early 20th centuries. And you saw, uh, you know, you saw these different uh, processes going on. Asian American immigrant laborers uh, were considered to be hard, harder workers, uh, reliable, kind of valorized, but also an economic threat. Uh, you had violent riots across the West Coast uh, where many of the laborers had settled. Uh, 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 they were an economic threat to white Americans. Uh, East Asian Americans are known as the yellow peril. Uh, South Asian Americans, you had terms like dusky peril, you know, people from the Indian subcontinent that hated Hindus. Uh, Immigration Act of 1917 essentially ended immigration from uh, Asian countries uh, for uh, several decades. Uh, so you had that kind of early history, but we know that uh, immigration from Asian countries reopened uh, after World War II. And this is related to the Cold War. The US and Soviet Union are the world's dominant powers after World War II. Uh, and in the late 1950s, 1960s, US needed more scientists and engineers to help fight the Cold War. You know, Soviet Union was the first into space with the Sputnik satellite. So there's this panic in this country. You know, we are falling behind the Soviet Union. We need more scientists and engineers. At the same time, countries like China, India, Korea, had a lot of scientifically trained professionals who didn't have as many economic opportunities in their homelands. So you had what uh, Professor Derek Bell referred to as interest convergence. You had these uh, 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 scientists and engineers in Asian countries. In the US, we needed them to help fight the Cold War. So the Immigration Act of 1965 was this kind of convergence of interests uh, whereby uh, uh, you had uh, occupational preferences for Asian or educated Asian immigrants within that act, uh, which allowed them to come over here relatively easy uh, uh, to work in technical, uh, various uh, technical uh, professions. Um, and this is kind of the basis for the model minority stereotype. You had educated uh, Asian immigrants coming over here. Uh, they're growing up in educated home environments. Their children uh, become high achievers uh, from these uh, educated environments. Uh, so you have this idea of the model minority, that Asian Americans uh, have this uh, cultural work ethic, uh, they're high achievers, and why can't all other minority groups do the same thing? And of course, this ignores the various barriers faced by different minority groups. You know, Neil referred to anti-Blackness, um, uh, Black Americans positioned very differently from Asian Americans. Uh, this also obscures socioeconomic disparities between various Asian American groups. You know, this model minority profile is one segment, these educated Asian uh, uh, immigrants from Asian countries, just one segment of the Asian American uh, population. Uh, you also have the uh, perpetual foreigner stereotype. Uh, that term is used by Professor Frank Wu. Neil has also uh, written about this a lot about foreignness uh, as, a, as a component of racialization, whereby Asian Americans are associated with their ancestral homelands, even if they are multi-generational Americans, even if it was their great, great grandparents, who immigrated to the US, uh, Asian Americans are still associated with their homelands. Uh, natives of Asian countries, recent immigrants, multi-generational Asian Americans all lumped uh, together. So you have these kind of larger stereotypes of Asian Americans. Uh, but in my work, I also talk about what I call these kind of derivative racial stereotypes, uh, you know, that emanate from the model minority and the perpetual foreigner. So model minority on its surface seems like kind of a positive, quote unquote, positive stereotype. Asian Americans are being valorized. Uh, but what also comes along with that is Asian Americans being viewed as a threat. And this idea of peril of the mind, uh, basically Asian American students in education seen as too competitive, 
displacing white students at elite schools. And uh, you know, we see this uh, with this uh, phenomenon of new quote unquote white flight as Asian American population in a school district grows. And this is not because the schools are bad. You know, this is the schools are good, uh, but Asian American students are in the schools uh, out competing white students. White parents fear that, you know, their children aren't gonna get into the best colleges. So they leave uh, the public schools in those districts. You also have the quote unquote passive nerd stereotype that Asian American students excel in math and science, but lack leadership skills or are socially inept. And this has been a theme in university admissions controversies from the 1980s to the current uh, Harvard case. Um, so we had uh, you know, the 1965 Immigration Act. Um, Asian American population grew a lot uh, after that. And there was a resentment here uh, uh, in reaction to that. Uh, uh, Neil mentioned the murder of Vincent Chin in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, there was also a murder of Navros Modi in New Jersey, Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, uh, immigrant uh, from India. Uh, so you had this backlash against different uh, Asian American groups. And this also filtered over onto college campuses in different ways. By the early 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s, you had large numbers of Asian Americans enrolling at elite universities, not long after the Supreme Court's Baki decision, which really uh, put diversity as, as an interest, uh, made uh, diversity a really important consideration. Uh, and uh, so you have all, all these Asian American students on these campuses and uh, you see epithets being used by white students on these campuses like resent, uh, who are resentful. MIT is called Made in Taiwan, UCLA, University of Caucasians, Lost Among Asians. Uh, and Asian American students are seen as these quote unquote curve breakers. You know, they're too competitive, they study too hard. Uh, you know, they're breaking the curve. Um, so you have a, 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 this resentment on, on these campuses in reaction to the growing Asian American student population. Uh, what happens in this context also, uh, some Asian American students suspect that elite universities want to limit their numbers. You know, there are a lot of Asian Americans uh, on these campuses, but universities don't want their campuses to look too quote unquote foreign. Uh, Princeton admission study showed that Asian Americans on average were rating higher on academic criteria but lower on non-academic criteria back in the 1980s. So they did well on tests and grades, but not as well on extracurricular activities. And this speaks to the passive nerd stereotype, Asian Americans good at science and math, but one dimensional uh, socially inept. Uh, but Asian Americans are suspecting there may be uh, discrimination going on against them. Allegations in the 1980s uh, at several universities, Asian American students protested uh, Dana Takagi's book, The Retreat from Race, kind of goes into this a bit, uh, but uh, UCLA, Berkeley, Princeton, Harvard, uh, protests, student protests, universities generally denied discriminating against Asian Americans, but there were civil rights complaints filed, um, and universities uh, agreed to be a little bit more transparent about what was going on. Uh, one investigation against UCLA found that UCLA had actually uh, discriminated against five Asian American students. Um, and those students were ordered to be admitted. Uh, Harvard was cleared of discrimination, but nevertheless, this set part of the context for the current uh, case against Harvard. Now, it's important to distinguish between uh, affirmative action and what uh, Professor Jerry Kong at UCLA School of Law calls uh, negative action. Affirmative action are policies or practices, including race conscious admissions policies, the use of race and admissions, which benefit underrepresented applicants in university admissions. So black, Latino, Native American applicants. And it's very important to support affirmative action so that we have you know, racial equity, diversity on college campuses. Negative action on the other hand are any policies, practices which may disadvantage Asian American applicants intentionally in comparison to white applicants uh, specifically on the basis of race. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, affirmative action, negative action are often conflated by conservative movement to try to eliminate, uh, you know, diversity on college campuses. But it's very important to keep them uh, separate as we are thinking about all of these uh, different issues. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, talking about the 1980s. We go through the 1990s. There's a backlash against uh, affirmative action. Places like California, uh, you have a referendum that eliminates affirmative action. Um, the Gratz and Gruder cases in, the, uh, in 2003 basically affirm uh, diversity as a compelling uh, interest, but there's continued litigation. You know, affirmative action is one of these things that is always challenged. Uh, 
Um, and with the Harvard case, Asian Americans kind of take a central role here uh, because uh, the Harvard case involves Asian American plaintiffs. And uh, what uh, Students for Fair Admissions, the ironically named organization uh, which is sponsoring this lawsuit, what they say is Harvard University discriminates against Asian Americans uh, in favor of both applicants of color and white applicants. So again, linking together affirmative action and negative action. Uh, this is kind of a broad challenge to uh, affirmative action, but it brings in allegations of negative action. Um, and it's not disputed that on average, admitted Asian American applicants to Harvard to other elite universities have higher grades and test scores than any other group. And, and there are various possibilities uh, why this may be. Asian Americans are underrepresented in legacy alumni admissions, athletic scholarships, uh, overrepresented in science and engineering majors, which typically may involve uh, uh, requiring uh, higher test scores. And then geographic differences, Asian American applicants tend to be concentrated on the East and West Coast and in large metropolitan areas. And uh, schools like Harvard do look for students uh, from uh, middle of America, uh, you know, places where they don't have as many applicants from. So different things going on here. Uh, the way that uh, SFFA frames this case, frames its case, part one of their case, if you looked at their complaint in brief, uh, completely about negative action, that white Americans are intentionally favored over Asian Americans. And they draw on these stereotypes that I mentioned earlier, the peril of the mind that you know uh, white Americans are afraid Asian Americans are taking over elite universities, that Asian Americans are seen as uh, socially inept. Uh, Part two of their uh, argument is an attack on affirmative action, that Harvard's race conscious plan designed to benefit black and Latino Native American students, uh, underrepresented students, the use of race in admissions as one factor, uh, that violates the law. Uh, so with respect to the part one, uh, the negative action claim, Harvard says, nope, we don't do it. Uh, we deny discrimination. With respect to affirmative action, Harvard admits, you know, we do a, a practice affirmative action. We do it legally consistent with the uh, Grutter uh, standard. Uh, what SFFA seeks as a remedy is to remove any references from race, to race from college applications, which how you would do that, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, be very difficult, but in theory that could end negative action, but it would also end uh, affirmative action. Um, so they kind of link the two together uh, in that way. Uh, now, if we look at, uh, you know, Harvard admissions, uh, we find that, you know, Asian Americans, again, uh, related, uh, uh, rated higher than white applicants on academic criteria and on extracurricular activities except for athletics, uh, but were rated lower uh, on the personal rating. And what is the personal rating? Personal rating is this assessment of character traits from teacher recommendations, perhaps from interviews, uh, other sources, council recommendations, essays, character traits such as positive personality, humor, sensitivity, grit, uh, all these things, courage, integrity. Uh, so Asian Americans are rate, rated lower here, and this plays again to this uh, passive nerd stereotype that Asian Americans are great students, but socially inept, uh, not, uh, not leadership material, etc. cetera. Uh, so at the district court, uh, district court le level uh, 2019, the judge, uh, Judge Allison Burroughs, ruled for Harvard, uh, said, you know, there's no intentional discrimination against Asian Americans. The record does not show that, um, clearly made that ruling. Uh, but also noted kind of within the context of the case that the disparity between white and Asian American applicants personal ratings has not been fully and satisfactorily explained and uh, suggested that there might be some implicit bias going on here though an implicit bias is kind of unconscious racial stereotyping as opposed to intentional discrimination and she said you know more likely maybe from a teacher counselor recommendations that maybe they view Asian Americans as less socially adept and in as much as that affects uh, you know, uh, uh, Harvard's uh, review of the applications that may lead to a lower personal rating. Uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the district court ruling. Harvard is not engaging in any illegal practice when it uses race uh, in admissions. It's perfectly consistent with the Grutter standard, Grutter Fisher standard. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, First Circuit affirmed. U.S. Supreme Court uh, will hear this case. Uh, next term, uh, along with a parallel lawsuit by Students for Fair Admissions against University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So this case is going before the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the broader context for all of this, because there's no doubt, you know, the lower courts ruled Harvard's race conscious plan is constitutional. 
Um, and uh, the evidence for intentional discrimination is not there. SFFA is kind of trying to frame uh, the uh, numbers to show that. And there was a lot of statistical analysis in this case, a lot of complex statistical models. The court said that Harvard's models were better than SSFA's models. But there is this notion that, you know, Asian Americans are rated lower on the personal rating. And this idea of a peril of the mind that Asian Americans are kind of a threat. And that shows up in the SFFA complaint in many different places through different comments, through different actions that uh, Harvard uh, has taken, what Harvard alumni has said. They, they draw on a lot of little anecdotes, kind of cherry pick those. Uh, but there's a broader context to how Asian Americans may view this, uh, view this whole issue. Uh, so this whole peril of the mind idea that Asian Americans are, you know, this academic threat. Uh, we see that in other places. Uh, you know, it's been covered in some sense in different uh, news articles. So we look at, uh, you know, California, Silicon Valley, uh, different places in California, uh, Lynbrook and Monte Vista High Schools in San Jose uh, are among the nation's top public schools. But from 95 to 2000, the proportion of white students dropped significantly at those schools. And it was not because those schools were poor performing schools. It's because uh, white families feared that the growing population of Asian American students would outcompete their children academically. Um, and you know, PTA president at Monte Vista said, white kids are thought of as the dumb kids here. Similar phenomenon more recently in, Atl in Atlanta suburb of uh, Johns, uh, Johns Creek, Georgia, uh, affluent suburb, population of white students in local public schools dropped by half since the mid 2000s. White parents explaining why. They said Asian parents take their kids for extra tutoring. It's not fair for the quote unquote regular kids. High school is too competitive. My kid won't get into good college because of all these Asians. Uh, so we see this kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of a new ironic white flight going on in different places. And this is a phenomenon that's, you know, gotten more attention. Um, all of this, you know, again, is in the backdrop of these lawsuits. Uh, other kind of uh, educational uh, controversies, uh, which are wrapped up, I think, in these lawsuits also, there is the test blind movement in college admissions uh, or, or college for college entrance exams. Recently, uh, many colleges and universities have begun to offer admission without requiring college entrance exams. Um, and particularly in the wake of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the requirements were waived. Uh, Harvard has waived their testing requirement for several more years. Um, so this is becoming more common. Asian American Coalition for Education has criticized this, saying, you know, this is a way to limit the numbers of Asian American students. Uh, you know, when you have this kind of holistic admissions process that's subject to racial stereotypes, like the one uh, that uh, came up in the Harvard case, the whole passive nerd stereotype. Uh, so there's been uh, some backlash among Asian American, some Asian American groups about this also. Uh, you know, and people have talked about just, you know, the, the, uh, place of test prep classes within, you know, kind of the Asian American uh, communities. Um, but this is also, uh, this is also something that's part of in, in the backdrop of uh, the affirmative action case and all these uh, other controversies. Uh, we also have in New York, right there in New York, the controversy over the specialized high school admissions test, uh, which has been the sole factor in admission to New York City public high schools for uh, 50 years or, or to eight of the nine selective uh, public high schools, the magnet schools. Uh, if you look at 2019, students admitted to Stuyvesant High School, 65% uh, were Asian or Asian American, uh, much greater than the population. Only 0.8% were Black. And uh, uh, then Mayor de Blasio proposed, Bill de Blasio proposed to eliminate the Shai Shat, uh, uh, phasing it out over three years. But Asian American families, they had felt like they had not been involved in the conversation. They mobilized against the elimination of the Shai Shat. And this also kind of reflects the idea of, of civic ostracism that uh, uh, Professor Kim talks about, that you know Asian Americans really weren't uh, informed and were not uh, involved in this conversation. Um, de Blasio scrapped the proposal for uh, 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 phasing out the uh, shy shat, but still advocate for eliminating it eventually. You know, and it's still an issue, uh, still a controversy. You know, uh, how, what are we gonna do about this test, which seems to be a limiting factor for admission of many different groups. This issue came up in the mayoral election in 2021. Uh, you look at these statistics there. In majority uh, Asian American precincts, Republican Kurtz, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Kurtz uh, Sliwa uh, won a higher percentage of votes in majority Asian American precincts than other precincts. He was still minority, he still didn't get the majority of the votes, but he got a higher percentage. And he had campaigned in some of these precincts uh, uh, 
expressing support for the quote unquote merit based uh, shy shy. And this is, as you know, in New York, a, a political issue with uh, you know, different sides to it. It's also noteworthy, many Asian American students in these uh, New York City specialized high school, many students from all backgrounds come from relatively low income families. They are not the really more privileged students that tend to you know, apply to Harvard or, or go to Harvard, uh, admitted to Harvard. Um, so there's a whole different dynamic here uh, also. Uh, there is the controversy in Fairfax County, Virginia, the Coalition for Thomas Jefferson v. Fairfax County School Board uh, lawsuit. Thomas Jefferson ranked as a top public high school in the US. Um, and again, uh, uh, a school board there changed the admissions process for the 2021 incoming class to improve diversity. And that led to a drop in Asian American admissions. And I actually created a little uh, chart here. Uh, Asian Americans in Fairfax County, 19.3% of the population. But in the class of 2024, 73% of these students admitted to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you see black students uh, highly underrepresented, white students also underrepresented, white students 61% uh, of the population, but only 17% in 2024 of, of those admitted. Um, 2025, with the new admissions policy, you saw a drop of 20% in Asian American students from 73 to 53%, still uh, you know, much greater than the representation in the population. But all other groups, including white students, uh, grew in the, with the new admissions policy, Asian Americans uh, dropped there. Um, so uh, Asian American student uh, parents felt that this was discriminatory, filed a lawsuit uh, on behalf of an organization they formed the quote unquote coalition for Thomas Jefferson. Um, <clears throat> district court in that lawsuit struck down the new Thomas Jefferson admissions policy. Uh, that ruling was stayed by the fourth circuit. Uh, so the new admissions policy still in place. And just yesterday, the Supreme Court denied a request by Coalition for Thomas Jefferson to lift that stay. Um, so the new admissions policy uh, is still in place. Um, and, uh, you know, the case will be heard on the merits by the Fourth Circuit and maybe eventually go to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. Uh, now, the way this policy was repealed, I think, is something that is, is noteworthy here. The vote to repeal the old admissions policy. Uh, took place only a month before an entrance exam for the new class. It was done at a work session that was not open to the public and not normally used for voting on such matters. And uh, Coalition for Thomas Jefferson alleged in their complaint, you know, uh, in these school board meetings that were discussing uh, revising the policy, there were different comments that referred to Asian uh, American students as ravenous, unethical. Parents are pushing their kids too hard. Uh, one comment even uh, referring to uh, families from India who. Uh, allegedly, teachers suggested they came here uh, illegally. And this was also a political issue in the Virginia gubernatorial election in 2021, where Republican Glenn Youngkin expressed his support for the coalition for Thomas uh, Jefferson. Uh, so we have a lot of political dynamics going on here that can divide uh, different groups of uh, people of uh, color. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, just to kind of conclude here, uh, Asian Americans, have to understand, we have to understand how conservative interests are pitting us against other marginalized groups. You know, I think unequivocally, we have to support racial equity, uh, affirmative action, and understand you know, what is going on here in the larger uh, racial framework, uh, racial hierarchy of the US. But I think uh, other groups, all groups have to understand the social, historical, political context for Asian Americans' concerns about testing about these admissions controversies. This is not all happening in a vacuum. And there is a, you know, real uh, forms of discrimination against Asian Americans in these contexts. Harvard is not discriminating uh, intentionally against Asian Americans. There might be some implicit bias involved there. You know, that's something that needs further investigation. But this peril of the mind phenomenon, this white flight from these schools, this is happening. You saw the comments that the parents are making. Uh, so we have to understand this broader context and address that at all. And, you know, we cannot accept discrimination against Asian Americans uh, either. I think, you know, these different uh, you know, uh, racial oppression is all linked in, in one way in the broader uh, scheme of things. And we have to understand how that happens. All groups have to be involved in conversations about education, racial equity, discrimination. And we really have to understand how different groups are pitted against each other, how these stereotypes of Asian Americans are kind of polar opposite of the stereotypes of, of Black Americans with respect to achievement, you know, passivity, all of these things. Uh, and I think one other question we have to raise in the context of affirmative action of these elite specialized schools is, are such conflicts just inevitable when we have elites and elitist educational institutions? We have a scarce resource, you know, uh, 
spots at, in Harvard University or Thomas Jefferson School, there's going to be competition for those spots. And that, uh, you know, that's going to lead to, to some level of uh, conflict. So let me, uh, let me stop there um, and, you know, uh, we can talk more in the Q&A uh, if uh, desired. Let me go ahead and stop this. Thank you. Professor Lin. Thank you. Let me make sure my PowerPoint is being shared. That was a wonderful set of presentations by my co-panelists, uh, Neil and Vinay. You are esteemed uh, CRT scholars and uh, Asian American jurisprudence scholars. And I am uh, you know, delighted to see that there was so much interest in this panel. Um, I'm gratified to Pace Law School and uh, to the student associations uh, coordinated by Kasama in giving us carte blanche to address key issues in Asian American communities and within the context of combating um, uh, racism at also a time when there's a backlash against those efforts, right? Uh, there's a critical moment in racial discourse in this country, in our local communities, where the idea of combating racism is in fact accused of being a, a, a form of racism. Um, we are here to um, you know, remind each other that when we celebrate uh, Asian American communities and we uh, discuss what is important to our communities, that racial identity is clearly salient as well as conversations uh, that are uh, involving uh, not just CRT, but also um, intersectional movements, right? For uh, LGBTQ rights and for, uh, uh, for class and economic justice. So, I wanted to focus on social movements because uh, Neil and Vinay have done uh, an excellent job laying the groundwork of what a CRT approach looks like. But I wanted to look from a non-legal perspective in how CRT's critique of law is used to develop um, not just education around racial formation, but also coalition, right? Um, we have, of course, the one year anniversary recently of the Atlanta Spa Massacre. And we have, as a community, just um, shown up for each other and also seen uh, an outpouring of support from our community uh, at, at, in various levels. But when we think about coalition, we should also think about what is positive about uh, the racial formation as we have it, right? Uh, as Neil had mentioned, the uh, ascriptive uh, identity, obviously um, uh, we are much more than what we are perceived by others who don't know us. But when we think about a coalitional identity, critical race theory can teach all of us, not just those in legal academia, uh, how we can apply this framework to um, expand and, and build our communities multiracially in coalition, right? Uh, so uh, I, I won't uh, rehash that. Uh, the, one of the core assumptions and insights, of course, is that race is not biological, but it's a socially constructed concept. Uh, we also, it follows, understand that the law is not neutral. This was the key insight from the 1970s and 80s when CRT emerged. Of course, social movements, um, uh, abolitionist movements, movements and, and labor movements um, uh, understood that the law is uh, a, a tool for uh, constructing race and also maintaining racial hierarchy. But once you understand that the law is not neutral within the US historical context, uh, we understand that it has actively um, and uh, if not overtly supported white supremacy. And so as we say uh, uh, these days, often in jest uh, with a little bit of cynicism, we are all textualists now. So how does the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the plain meaning of white supremacy uh, 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 become defined? Because the meanings listed in the, uh, the current Merriam-Webster reflect, in fact, not 
and isolated extreme example of white supremacy only involves KKK rallies or that it involves only those who self-identify as white supremacists, but rather it involves the belief that the white race is inherently superior or a model for others, right? And you're held to these standards um, so that the social, economic, and political systems will enable those who are white to maintain power over those who are considered non-white. Asian Americans, no differently from other communities, have developed theories about uh, sources of racial division. And in that analysis have informed activist movements um, uh, to, uh, for self-determination, for uh, opposing uh, uh, a coercive state um, actions such as uh, racist immigration laws or deportation and uh, increasingly anti-carceral um, strategies that that um, do not in fact uh, create security in our communities. So we think about how communities talk to each other and share similar analyses about the role of institutions like government or like uh, courts. And we think about how in fact we use that um, analysis to combat racism regardless of whether it's called critical race theory. So, um, my co-panelists have covered this uh, in depth, but certainly uh, as an Asian American, um, I, I, you know, always am reminded of the construction, the, the idea of Asia itself uh, representing more than 300 languages. And as an attorney at the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, um, you know, having a network of volunteer interpreters in dozens of languages in order to serve our communities. And what did it mean to serve Asian immigrants? What did it mean um, when we uh, try to draw a circle around such a diverse uh, population, not just in terms of migration patterns, um, there are a few illustrations of diasporas uh, here, but also, of course, in, in, uh, in history, relative history in the United States and uh, ability to feel solidarity with each other, um, uh, given the recency of the Asian American community. Um, what I do in um, my first year orientation when I was teaching at NYU was actually to talk about the ways in which the law is a moving target. It is constructed. Um, it does not come down from, uh, from on high, but in fact is downstream of three key concepts in the law. And this applies whether I'm teaching uh, first year luring or employment discrimination or corporations or contracts. Law and hierarchy are embedded in our history, in norms, what we consider to be, quote, quintessentially American in terms of our values and uh, essential to our democracy. And also, of course, then once we uh, have a settlement, a settled understanding of what that history and, and our shared norms are, we have a prescriptive strategy. Um, this applies across all ideological movements, right, from those who support the Second Amendment to those who are supportive of uh, racial justice and, um, uh, and, and eliminating police-involved uh, shootings of communities of color. So something I wanted to highlight, given uh, this new wave of uh, interest in advocacy, particularly in response to this surge and this unfortunate surge in, in vi violence, um, which has terrified so many Asian American communities, is to put it in the context of uh, Asian American movements. Because the model minority myth Vinay talked about obscures a very long and insidious history of government disinvestment or neglect of Asian American communities, particularly those that are immigrant and particularly assuming that Asian Americans are, for example, a wealthy or well-to-do uh, self-sufficient uh, population when in fact, uh, if you look, if you were to plot um, the class distribution of Asian American communities, it's more of an hourglass shape where uh, the top might be, um, uh, have a concentration, but at the very bottom, there is, uh, you know, a, a, a proportionate 
uh, share of those communities that um, for various reasons uh, have experienced continued social uh, marginalization and poverty. And so the, the activism from the 1960s and 70s when the Asian American identity, the modern identity um, emerged uh, often uh, uh, revolved around um, issues of uh, community development. And I'll talk about what it looks like in the New York City contest when we map uh, the certain commitments and demands that Asian American groups have made. Uh, Vincent Chin's murder, which we talked about in 1982, was the most, uh, was the earliest to be highly publicized. It launched a national movement and it's considered as much a political watershed for Asian Americans as it was for uh, Emmett Till. So in, in Vincent Chin's case, uh, his, uh, the trial of his murderers were, um, uh, was was considered uh, the one of the I believe it, it was the first ever uh, hate crimes uh, trial again involving uh, the uh, the an attack on against an Asian American and so of course it was highly watched and I'll return to that in a moment. Uh, we also have the instance of um, the conviction of Officer Peter Lang in New York City. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the case, um, in November 2014, we have decades after Vincent Chin, a, 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 a concern raised by uh, Asian American communities around a rookie cop who was convicted of uh, second degree manslaughter, second degree assault, among other things, for uh, uh, the death of Akai uh, Gurley, a 24-year-old young man um, uh, who was unarmed and uh, whom Liang shot in a stairwell. Thousands had mobilized to uh, you know, uh, address whether there was a, racial a racially motivated prosecution, given that for decades in New York, no officer in fact had been convicted in an officer-involved shooting. Uh, but he was in 2016. Uh, this, of course, um, really uh, brought to the fore a kind of polarization in views, which I, I think uh, is addressed with great nuance in the film uh, Down a Dark Stairwell, because it, it highlights that Asian American communities uh, also had rallied around uh, Akai Gurley's family. And, what the movements demanding justice in this case was in a sense often viewed as diametrically opposed and certainly the groups um, uh, within the Asian American community uh, uh, debated or clashed with each other, but certainly um, critical race theory would argue for there to, um, for, for the, this debate to in fact not be mutually exclusive. However, um, one of the most important parallels with the Vincent Chin case is that um, Officer Liang, while convicted, never served time in prison. He was, uh, um, uh, he was uh, essentially serving parole for five years with uh, a hefty penalty, but uh, much like Vincent Chin's um, uh, uh, murderers, um, he, uh, they did not spend any time in jail. Um, but in Peter Lang's case, the uh, concerns were that um, an officer should be tried in a colorblind way, and it raised an awareness that certain uh, communities were uh, uh, ha did not have the civil rights history to put in context whether or not it was in fact the same institution that made uh, communities feel unsafe that um, was in fact um, uh, to blame for having assigned a rookie officer to a, uh, a, a very troubled housing complex um, within his first two years of service. Um, since the, in, in uh, Akai Gurley's case, the shooting was accidental. So the, the other aspect of um, contextualizing the violence against Asian Americans is to think about how current coalitional work has um, advanced. So if 
punishment uh, of those who commit hate crimes is considered um, motivated by hatred. We wonder then, is it, is it a, a sufficiently um, meaningful model to, to, to think about how a person can self-identify and then uh, be targeted as Vincent Chin was, right, being perceived as a Japanese American uh, when he was Chinese American, that 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 ascription by someone who uh, expresses hatred for that group is in itself um, a way of con conceiving of uh, the the harm. But if we were to take the Vincent Chin case and think about how many of the motives are far more complicated um, than, than can be ascribed simply to um, being motivated by Japanese competition. The auto workers in the Vincent Chin case who brutally attacked him were said to have been motivated by uh, you know, the influx of Japanese cars in the industry. And so it is impossible to separate the animosity from some of the economic motives or, uh, motives or the thoughts of scarcity, um, very much in, in similarity to what Vinay was discussing as to these finite seats at elite schools and thinking about how um, the conversation has shifted to this um, high stakes zero sum game rather than the quality of education overall and access to quality education. Um, now, the other, um, the other part of thinking about how Asian Americans can, uh, can, can navigate racial formation, um, if there is, of course, uh, a sense that Asian Americans uh, are, should not be viewed as anything but human, right, that, that dignified self-identity, um, self we cannot move beyond hate, uh, vi uh, racially motivated hate crimes, if in fact the government is the one leading the charge, um, engaging in racist rhetoric. And so the defendants are in fact mirroring and mimicking what are um, uh, the, the attitudes and the, um, the dog whistle messages that come from the government, such as through the Japanese American internment, uh, the forcible uh, relocation of an entire ethnic group, uh, regardless of the actual state of national security, and of course, uh, the Trump effect. So one of the counter questions for developing an identity that in fact represents a dignified view of oneself, what can the government do to deter um, you know, these, these, um, you know, these stereotypes, this animosity, this, uh, uh, this uh, scapegoating or violence that Asian Americans are experiencing. And there is actually very little in terms of a counter example to uh, the government uh, treating Asian Americans uh, as full citizens and, and um, uh, full participants. Um, I give a counterexample since this chart is um, based on my, my last piece involving uh, gender identity uh, in the wake of Bostock, the Bostock decision, and in the context of gender diversity, uh, the government con counteracted dehumanization of LGBTI individuals by leading by example. Um, implementing personnel policies that in fact um, uh, required that these identities be respected, uh, whether someone identified as a, a trans person identified as a particular gender, the government from courthouses to uh, federal agencies to um, uh, uh, you know, the, inside the, 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 in the three branches of government itself had to abide by this policy, but we don't have that level of understanding uh, 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 that is reflected beyond, let's say, a token 
Asian American Advisory Committee to the White House. Uh, I wanted to also um, note that in the last 20 years in New York City, and this is something that um, advocates um, who have worked, I think, primarily in, not, in a non-legal capacity would kind of find familiar. If you were to think about where communities um, congregate and what causes them to form coalitions and advocate for greater resources, for changes in the law, or for um, uh, building an alternative uh, definition of community, I, I, you know, put together this map, which is essentially what's in my brain, having uh, been a community organizer and also a community-based lawyer, and think about um, the the role that each of these organizations have needed to play and how far the community has come since the 1960s, because. Uh, the analysis and the, uh, the, the, the contribution of critical race theory has been to allow these groups to be in dialogue with each other about the best way to achieve uh, community health, community security, and uh, to fight racism. And I want to highlight a couple of these organizations. For example, uh, in the post-pandemic rise in hate crimes, the Blasian March Right, uh, representing Black and Asian, those with uh, mixed race background and both communities came together to express solidarity. Um, they also marched during Pride and they had a coalitional anti-carceral analysis um, uh, to, uh, think, to thinking about the sources of violence in communities because something that is not as well known and not discussed in the same breath of you know, these you know, intermittent articles uh, on how the hate crimes against Asian Americans has, has not uh, abated, is that violence against Black and Asian Americans have both climbed in the past year precipitously. In 2020, just in terms of those incidents that are called hate crimes that targeted Black individuals, it rose to 20, about 2750 from 1900, about 1900 from last year, the previous year, 2019. And then uh, against Asian Americans, as we know, it also climbed uh, it, uh, to, I believe, over 100,000 uh, during the pandemic. So this kind of, um, kind of uh, coincidental analysis, of course, CRT will say it's not coincidental, but requires us to think, well, how do we talk about demanding resources or attention for our community that is inclusive of, but not limited to our own communities, right? When there are movements, for example, uh, called Stop AAPI Hate, we of course uh, would like the, those communities to uh, consider whether or not there are demands that can be made outside of, let's say, uh, criminal justice reform or only asking for more funding for police. So the executive director of NAPOF has, has cautioned, for example, that you don't break cycles of violence by locking more people up. But um, uh, in fact, somehow that does not inf make all Asian American women safe. Rohan Jo Lee, the Blasian March co-founder said, uh, solidarity of course is the answer. Education, mutual celebration is the answer. We do this together. And so um, to wrap up, it was incredibly important for these communities to uh, think about uh, what messages are we receiving about the source of attacks? What are the causes um, that can be attributable to, um, uh, to the violence uh, that we're currently experiencing? And what demands can be made? Because certainly funding community organizations is not a silver bullet. And, um, and so um, my, my summary, of course, is to say that we don't necessarily need more laws. We need uh, more community education and we need CRT. Uh, I imagine there will be some uh, questions from the audience and I look very much look forward to hearing from you to um, uh, get, uh, hear your thoughts about uh, our presentations. Thank you.
Professor Lin, did you want to kick off the Q&A with some of your questions? We, we do have two questions in the Q&A to address, but feel free if you'd like to kick off with some of your own questions. You're muted. I actually do not see the questions. If you don't mind popping them into the chat, I appreciate it um, so that it's current. Um, but I do have a question first for, for Neil because his, um, his update to kind of the geopolitics and the, the need for CRT not to look solely at, you know, uh, US borders, but also uh, the international as part of the racial formation in the US is, is really important, of course, uh, to thinking, well, how with this insight with the Cold War, this new Cold War, do we build a basis for interracial coalition in CRT? There's a question for me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I don't have any um, simple answers. Uh, I don't even have any complicated, I don't have any answers at all. Um, but I do know that um, looking back at, at the history of American wars in Asia, uh, and in particular, the Japanese American experience uh, was very complex uh, and very conflicted um, uh, because there were, uh, uh, because the backdrop is US-Japan war, which at one level was sort of, you know, um, uh, American traditional democracy, but at the uh, sort of the old uh, imperialist politics, it was an inter-imperial rivalry. It was all about the, the extension of national power uh, in Asia and the rivalry and the conflict between um, Japan and the United States in World War II. And in terms of the, the social setting, um, the imperial Japanese government uh, was uh, not just you know, undemocratic and not particularly nice, um, they were guilty of extraordinary uh, of what we would today classify as war crimes uh, uh, against humanity, in particular in China, and so and Korea, and so the um, the ability to sort of like uh, choose a national identity as a starting point uh, in U.S. and China is uh, complex, because uh, on the on the one hand, um, there's uh, every reason to see the US as being aggressive and an instigator in Asia, and then the corresponding result uh, of treatment of Chinese Americans. Um, but to sort of then valorize China and, and its domestic and international policies is um, not exactly necessarily a position we would, that we all, that, that we would seek to valorize as being a starting point for the conversation. So, um, it's about us, that is to say, diasporic immigrant communities and their descendants in the United States. And that's why I suggest the black-white paradigm becomes the appropriate starting point for understanding what may or may not happen to us. Right? We live uh, in a settler community. The entire United States is occupied territory in one historical viewpoint. So, um, without taking into consideration the multiplicity of all these uh, considerations, uh, I think we have to be much more specific and policy oriented, maybe perhaps be more specific. Which policy against China and which effect upon Chinese Americans and Asian Americans uh, can we identify and address? Mm. Mm. No, thank you. Um, for I Renee, I, no, no, I, I, I think it's. It, it seems uh, challenging to, to know that in terms of community agents, agency, right? Uh, thinking about what Asian American communities are, are, are doing to combat that and, and forge their own identity that we're facing something very similar dynamics essentially from uh, half a century ago. Um, but uh, more on that, I think uh, in Q and A, because we have a question about uh, CRT promoting CRT in public schools. But first, I did want to uh, follow up with Vinay about um, 
what Asian American students or Asian Americans in the Harvard community have said, uh, given that very, very often you have like uh, a man on the street quote, and in fact, uh, there's an organization, there's organizations that represent thousands of current or former uh, Harvard students. So I'm curious uh, whether there's, there's a, a space for those voices right now. Yeah, I think, um, you know, by and large, uh, Harvard students, Asian American students of Harvard have supported affirmative action. You know, they're not uh, aligned with SFFA. Uh, I've done many interviews with the uh, Harvard Crimson, the, the student newspaper there, including with the Asian American reporters. And I mean, you know, the, uh, I think uh, they're by and large in, in support of diversity, in support of affirmative action. I think, you know, there are different concerns about, you know, uh, incidents of racism on campus. I think that happens, you know, every university. But I think they, you know, divorce that from uh, affirmative action. Uh, I think, I mean, you know, elite universities, you know, you have this kind of a ethos of, of diversity of just, you know, representation. And I do think, um, you know, we have to kind of think beyond Harvard also, because, you know, this case is going to Supreme Court, but we have the Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. case, we have the Chai Chat controversy in New York, we have a lot of other issues also. And I think, you know, there's kind of a, maybe somewhat of a disconnect between rank and file Asian Americans and those in more elite institutions when it comes to issues like this. I mean, you look at polls, I think, you know, close to 70% of Asian Americans will answer, you know, yes, when you asked if, if you support affirmative action. Uh, how strong that support is, you know, uh, uh, you know, how strong it is, uh, what their understanding of affirmative action is, uh, that could be another issue, you know, um, I mean, those of us at universities, you know, who work in these areas of diversity, uh, you know, we kind of understand this whole ethos of diversity, but, you know, out in, throughout the country and other places and less elite spaces, people don't always understand what's going on with affirmative action, you know, just talking to people, including Asian Americans. So that's why I think, you know, we really have to mm -hmm. kind of address both sides of this, address the importance of diversity, importance of racial equity, but also address some of the experiences that Asian Americans are having, like some of the things I referred to. Okay. Great. Well, I, I see that one audience member would like to know if you think there's uh, some legal uh, possibility of holding against Harvard just based on negative action without overturning affirmative action. But before that, I do want to go, uh, I'll let you think about that because I do want to ask uh, Neil a question from the audience about advancing CRT in public education systems and equal access to education. I, I suppose that goes to both our panelists, my, my fellow panelists, but I'm curious, Neil, what you think. Um, I, this is, it's good because one of the footnotes that I wanted to be sure to mention uh, is the African-American Policy Forum. Uh, they have a website, but this is uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, friend and colleague, back from traditional uh, critical race theory. She's uh, um, um, sort of the intellectual, uh, uh, one of the intellectual parents of critical race theory. Um, and the African-American Policy Forum has emerged as being uh, uh, a, a central actor in both documenting and organizing um, uh, around educational questions. So. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, a reference and a footnote, African American <laughs> Policy Forum. Uh, it's a very, you can just, just do a search on that term, that name, uh, and the website is informative. It contains uh, information, programmatic suggestions. So that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Now, for Asian Americans, it's all new. The, the idea that there is dog whistle politics going on among Asian Americans that is involved in racial formation is something that I think um, uh, um, someone like the work of Bob Chang, uh, your work, Shirley, very nice work, mm -hmm. are all aspects of this. And um, it's part of what we have to think through as to what it is we, we Asian Americans, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, South Asians, whatever are uh, the, the particularities of identification are, have to think through as to what is, uh, how are we going to respond to the violence that's coming? I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm not the only one who's predicting this. Wow, thank you. Uh, Vinay, did you have a um, prediction as to what's happening 
uh, after the Supreme Court hears the appeal in October in the Harvard case. Yeah, it's not looking too good in terms of just, you know, race conscious admissions uh, generally. I mean, we we all know the composition of the court has gotten a lot more conservative. So I don't, you know, I mean, I don't have an optimistic prediction, um, you know. <laughs> mm. uh, well, uh, to, uh, further to the question about how informative uh, this set of presentations has been, uh, there are certainly requests for copies of your slides. So anything I think that's open access would certainly help combat misinformation. Uh, it's very incredibly helpful uh, to see this level of interest. Um, I have a, a, I see that, um, Bob Chang has a comment, not a question. Um, you're struck by Neil's comment about the limits of calls for solidarity and the need to center anti-Blackness, right? Um, we do have to recognize the role that anti-Blackness has played. And I think uh, with the, uh, the erosion of Asian American studies, certainly um, in, in higher education and certainly uh, the lack of it in K through 12, we have concerns about uh, students being able to draw the parallels and knowing how much of the, the privileges we enjoy today are of course, uh, thanks to the, 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 the sacrifices of uh, uh, the activists and uh, generations of African-Americans who have struggled for equality. Um, that, that certainly needs to uh, move forward. I see we have a couple of new questions or comments. Um, who do we think, Donna Lee asks, is the target audience for our remarks? Uh, Neil or Vinay? Uh, hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, they are different remarks. I think everything we're talking about is important for really everyone. I mean, I think Asian Americans are, you know, I think not as much a part of the discourse on race in America as, as we need to be. I think, you know, a lot of those issues, everyone needs to learn about them because I think, you know, Neil alluded to this, I alluded to this, uh, the way uh, Asian Americans are positioned in US society, you know, it's, uh, we can think about the, you know, uh, black white framework and anti-blackness and, you know, white privilege, white supremacy, but all, the way any one group is positioned affects the way other groups are positioned also. You know, the way anti-blackness operates Asian Americans have an effect on this. I think the model minority idea and, and all these other things are there. So I would say, you know, our audience is basically anyone who cares about racial equity in America. You know, I, I think, I mean, for me in particular, I try to bring out some of these issues about, you know, just the experiences that Asian Americans have had in the educational settings, because I don't, I think that's not talked about enough in say like civil rights circles when we are really mobilizing to defend affirmative action and these policies for racial equity, as we should be, as we absolutely should be. Sometimes the legitimate concerns that Asian Americans may have about negative action, about the peril of the mind idea, those get marginalized. And perception is as important as uh, reality. I think, you know, you, you asked about the prospect of negative action, even if that's not really happening, uh, you know, even if there's no real, that much discrimination against Asian Americans in favor of white Americans, the perception that is happening is going to affect political alignments within our community. And that's why I brought out, you know, the New York mayoral election, the election in Virginia of, of Glenn Youngkin as governor. Uh, you know, I think we have to really think even beyond affirmative action, beyond these Supreme Court cases, how is this going to affect coalitions between people of color? Yes, yes. And uh, it dovetails with Annie Wong's questions really well. She asks, how do we address anti-Black racism among, among some in the AAPI community? and how it informs the conversation around anti-Asian violence and policing, right? So at least in New York, the response from Governor Hochul has been in fact to increase the budget for policing and, and prisons. Uh, and, and you know, it seems a reflection of the, the growing political clout, but without that um, level of engagement and agency that reflects the full nuance of uh, Asian American uh, communities' opinions as to uh, what the root causes might be, right? Uh, holistic community uh, development to uh, ensure we uh, make sure people are housed, have access to mental health support, uh, being able to uh, um, do more than just create uh, better information gathering as we saw in the federal legislation. Uh, Neil, any thoughts about um, anti-Black racism in the AAPI community? 
Oh, hang on a second. Oops, I, let me just clear my, uh, my, I have stuff on my screen that's, yeah. Um, uh, I, other than to, to, which is now emerged that at the level of organizing, this is a very serious and real question. Um, I really, uh, I don't, uh, I don't have any, I, I think your comments and I think, uh, um, um, the comments, the Dinesh comments are all much more relevant that the kind of abstract level of theorizing that I engage in um, can help. Um, so so uh, all I can add is as bad as this may seem in terms of uh, white supremacy uh, at the level of uh, popular culture and uh, the um, what I you know the dog whistle critical race theory at attacks. Um, it's actually worse at uh, um, some of the jurisprudential levels. Um, mm -hmm. the, one, the 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 stuff that goes on, on in terms of the uh, what what would claim to be a constitutional discussion about race um, at any level of social interaction and theory um, is laughable. I mean, there, there really is, it, it's, it's strict scrutiny for a racial category. And that's all, uh, that's, you know, the Supreme Court's discourse has not, uh, and, and doctrinal move, hasn't moved beyond it, which is why, as Benet can say, these guys, uh, these folks, this, not these guys, these folks on the Supreme Court um, are perfectly happy to strike down affirmative action without even thinking about uh, the doctrinal and uh, social and constitutional implications, they're perfectly ready to move. And so um, the, the, the difficulty of trying to carry on at that level, any discussion is uh, um, um, uh, extreme, it's extremely difficult. So how that translates down to practical politics, I have some thoughts, but um, nothing that I could do in a 10 second soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everyone would very much like to hear what you think and uh, we'll, we'll find a way to uh, keep you out of retirement, Neil. <laughs> okay, Benet, um, what did you want to, to add? Uh, any concluding remarks? And I think, I mean, Neil said it there, this has been a wonderful conversation. You know, I think all of us brought uh, different perspectives to a very important issue. So I've really enjoyed it. So thank you. Likewise, and uh, with that, uh, I. Thank everyone in the audience who's been so engaged. It is um, for us a, a privilege to uh, be able to close out uh, Asian American Heritage Month with you. And it, we hope this conversation will continue in uh, some form and maybe perhaps a more interactive form. But I would be remiss not to uh, reiterate our profound thanks to Kasama Starr, to uh, the Appulsive Pace Law, the uh, Immigration Law Society, and also the Public Interest Law Students Association and uh, our, co our many co-sponsors for making today possible. Thank you so much. Uh, there will be a video link, I, I suppose that can be circulated to everyone who registered, as well as uh, the, uh, the chance to, of course, uh, get copies of the presentations if you haven't received it already. Kasama, do you have any uh, closing remarks or housekeeping matters? Yes, I do. Um, first of all, thank you so much, um, Professors um, Lynn, Harpalani, and Gotanda for advancing um, this very important conversation. And of course, thank you to um, Abani and Pace Law and um, Dean Anderson and um, all of our sponsors. Um, I also need to uh, read this last CLE code for the attorneys who are attending for CLE. Again, thank you so much to all of our sponsors and our panelists and our audience.